basically we're stuck here and we're stuck here forever uh, on the planet. It's a nice planet. It gets worse. We are limited to the surface of this planet. Uh, we can't live underground, not for any length of time. And we can't live more than about 5,000 meters up. I think the highest human uh, settlement, long-term settlement is in Peru and it's 5,100 meters. We can't really live for any length of time beyond that. If you do a little math, that's 55 football fields. So basically your life is gonna be spent in a layer that's 55 football fields thick and that's it. Uh, so colonizing another planet, we talk a lot about living on Mars or, or, or frankly jetpacks, getting jetpacks so we can zoom around at will you know, up, up there, probably not gonna happen, probably not. Prove me wrong, prove me wrong. Let's see, it gets even worse. If that weren't enough of a constraint that we live in this thin little layer on this planet, we're also stuck with a biased jump to conclusions brain. And what I mean by that is we don't see reality. Our brain is connected to our eyes and the other senses through wires or nerves, not through tubes that see the outside world. So basically the brain is getting little dots and dashes, little electrical impulses, and it has to decide what do those impulses mean? So when we look at something, the brain gets a little bit of input and it has to quickly decide, what am I seeing? And it tells you then what you're seeing. This is a good example, this photo here where uh, the brain makes an error. Uh, we see something, but it's not what's actually happening. So the brain gets these electrical signals and uses them to tell us what's going on out there. And what happens is that we never have full information and we need to know pretty fast. If you're driving, if you're walking along, if something's happening, there's not a lot of time for your brain to ruminate about what might this data coming in be about. It has to decide really quickly for our safety. So it's constantly jumping to conclusions. And the way it jumps to conclusions, by the way, you have an engineer talking about the brain now, so take it with a grain of salt. The way it jumps to these conclusions is it gets these dots and dashes coming in from the senses and it compares that to a library that you've built up, kind of a reference library that you've built up over time based on your experiences starting as a child. So the particular neural library that you've built up from your childhood drives how you perceive and react to the world. And the brain does this, you'll notice it says quickly and silently. It's not telling you that it's jumping to these conclusions. It's got to do it instantly and it's got to do it very quietly. Your brain doesn't say to you, I don't know what that is. Hold, please gather more data. Let's do an analysis here. It decides really quickly what something out there is and it gives you a feeling of certainty that you know what that is. Now it works pretty well. It works pretty well. Most of the time the brain's jumping to conclusions all the time. So you look at a coffee cup, the brain gets the data, gets those electrical impulses and says, yeah, that's a coffee cup right? Pretty good. Now the coffee cup could be hot, there could be something in it, but by and large that worked, right? We see the coffee cup. But there's a lot of stuff where the brain doesn't know, but it still jumps to the conclusion. We don't know what's at the end of that road. We don't know what's coming next. So as a result of this jump to conclusions mechanism, which is very handy to have, gets us through but as a result of this mechanism, at all times, all of the following are potentially biased and unreliable. That's your assumptions, your opinions, your perceptions, your memory, your perspectives, all of that is potentially biased. So that's the end of my presentation. I wish I had better news, but uh, basically we're tapping around in the dark uh, with a sensory system that distorts. And uh, I I'm sorry to be the bringer of bad news. But wait a minute, let's wait a minute. Here's the cool thing. In that thin little layer that we live in on the surface of this planet, there is an infinite, a lifetime worth of things for you to discover. Uh, and that's what I mean by an interesting, enjoyable, fun, satisfying life. And, and I think one key to that meaningful life, to your success as an organization, your success as a team, your success as an individual, is to get good at the process of discovering the reality beyond your current perceptions. Your brain's doing a, you know, what it can, 
It's getting you through, but there's a lot more to discover out there. And, and surprise is not a word that you often hear in the business world. It's not perceived as a positive thing in the business world, but it, it's a lot of what this is about. And a lot of what adaptiveness and resilience builds on is being able to utilize surprise to your advantage. And with some practice, it even becomes fun. And that's what Toyota Kata is about. The research was done in production settings. It started looking at production systems, but uh, I think where it's taken me at this point, the Toyota Kata book came out in 2009, so it's about 12 years ago. At this point, it's taken me to a broader plane. Let's take a look at Toyota Kata. Real quick, there were two research questions uh, back earlier, earlier part of this century. Uh, question one, what are the unseen managerial routines and thinking that lie behind Toyota's success with continuous improvement and adaptation? Second question, okay, if we can figure that out, what, what, what's some of this unseen stuff? What are they doing in their management system? If we can figure that out, the second question becomes, well, how can other companies do that? Right? How can they develop similar routines and thinking in their organizations? You may be wondering why Toyota, I saw someone chatted that they love Toyota. It is an interesting company. It caught our attention for a number of reasons. One of them is 60 years of profitability. That's pretty unusual. It keeps improving. And maybe even the most interesting, they, they seem to be able to keep an inventive entrepreneurial mindset going, even in a mature company. And that's a rarity. There were three phases of the research. Number one, it's pretty obvious. Uh, you study how Toyota managers operate and think, not so easy since thinking is invisible. Dropping down from that, you try to describe that. Uh, I described it in two different models and that arrow should go back and forth. There's kind of a back and forth between studying, trying to figure it out, making a model, studying it, trying to make a model. Eventually the model kind of starts to stop, stops oscillating and you, you have a, what you think is a pretty good model. The third layer of the Toyota Kata research was to develop starter Kata practice routines that others can use to develop similar skills and thinking in their organizations. And, and that one, the first two layers are pretty standard for research. The third part, uh, these starter Kata practice routines, that's kind of born out of the realization of how we learn new skills and uh, habits. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So question one, what are these unseen managerial routines and thinking that lie behind their success? These were the findings. There's visible stuff at Toyota, their results, their lean tools and techniques that you can see if you visit a Toyota facility. By and by, what we found was uh, some less visible stuff, two points here. One is kind of a systematic scientific way of thinking and acting, a practical everyday way, scientific way of thinking and acting. Uh, and number two, that the managers are kind of the coaches. They're the teachers of that way. That way is not natural to us humans. Our natural way is to jump to conclusions and be pretty certain about those conclusions, which is not very scientific. So there has to be a conscious effort to teach a scientific thinking, and that's the role of the line managers uh, at Toyota. What's kind of interesting about the bottom part of this diagram, the blue part, the less visible stuff, is that while the top is Toyota specific, if you visit Toyota and look at their specific solutions, Jeff mentioned Kanban and so forth, uh, those are Toyota specific things. But what you see in the blue box down below is not Toyota specific. That can actually be used everywhere. This led to the two models. Jeff talked about the improvement kata model. It's just a four step model of how they tend to think. There's also a coaching kata model. George Box said all models are wrong, some are useful. These models are simply an attempt to describe what we found. And each manager will have their own style. But if you look long enough, they tend to think and act this way. Uh, and these are, you know, ultimately you get this sort of aha moment. You say, oh, you know what? These are actually scientific thinking patterns. That does raise the question, what do we mean by scientific thinking? And Jeff already covered this really well. Uh, it's a great way of approaching situations, goals, and problems. Acknowledging that you don't have full information, you never have full information. Number two, as Jeff pointed out, assuming that we're going to find answers by trying things and seeing what happens. And the third one is the tough one. 
appreciating, and I chose that word on purpose, appreciating that if there's a difference between what you thought would happen and what actually happens, that you're going to learn from that and that that's actually useful. And I, I can't say that I love the third one. I still get a kind of a, a, a disappointed feeling when I have an idea in my head and I try and it doesn't work out. But usually shortly thereafter, I'm like, okay, great. Reality has spoken. This is the kind of thinking that we found Toyota and Toyota managers are trying to instill in their people because it's powerful thinking. Imagine if everyone thought like this on the planet, imagine what we could achieve. And again, Notice that none of this on this slide is Toyota specific. This is useful because of the way our brain works, everybody's brain. So what's different about scientific thinkers? Okay, children, you know, I think you can probably remember this in your lifetime, children think their beliefs are mental copies of reality. What you're seeing is reality, what you're thinking is reality. If I close my eyes, you can't see me, that kind of thing. As adults, of course, we realize that our mental representations are not necessarily matching external reality. But a scientific thinker goes one step further. It's like an extra bit. And they take, they, they utilize the difference between what their brain is thinking and what reality shows them by and by unfolding reality. And they use the comparison between those two to learn and as Jeff said, to iterate, iterate their way forward. Um, a scientific thinker is not immune to fear. If you throw a scientific thinker a challenge, they will go, oh boy, that's kind of scary. I'm not sure how we're gonna do that. And as I just mentioned, I think a scientific thinker will be disappointed if their thoughts or their hypotheses are refuted, but then they pretty quickly say, okay, what am I learning? How do I need to adjust? And how do I go forward based on that? What this is, is navigating with a compass instead of a map. If you have a map, that's great. But in many situations, and perhaps more in the 21st century than in the 20th century, or at least the latter half of the 20th century, we don't have maps. So scientific thinking, as Jeff and I are describing it here, may be the best means we currently have for navigating through complex, dynamic, unpredictable territory. And again, I mean that in your business organization, your business team, but frankly, also in your personal life. Here's kind of the engineering track in the bottom part. We have a lot of knowledge. We have tables of speeds and feeds and so forth. And we can look these things up. Others have gone before us and figured these things out. And we should definitely use that knowledge. It's not like you have to start from zero every time. But when you take existing knowledge and apply it in a new situation, it may or may not work the same way. There's no guarantee that past experiences will be consistent with future situations. So yes, let's have these, this existing knowledge, but let's also have the skill to use that knowledge and iterate our way forward. I think we get into trouble if we rely too much on, we know we have it, we can look it up. We calculated it. Okay, we calculated it. Let's see what happens when we apply it in the real world. Just keep that mind open a little bit. And this is the cool part. It's scientific thinking is content neutral. So this is an excellent thing to teach. It's an excellent thing to practice. It's an excellent thing to teach to children because it's content neutral. We do not know what we'll be facing in the future. The children in our, our, our grade school classes, uh, the college students in our classes, we don't know what they're gonna face. So how useful to teach a meta skill that's content neutral with which they can find their own way in whatever situations they're faced with. Here's kind of a Homer Simpson dope slap moment I've had. Planning is important, but here, here's an interesting thing to keep in mind. When you make your plan, you are at the point of maximum uncertainty about how that trip will go. Tomorrow, after you've taken the first step, you'll know more. So planning is important, but don't get too hung up on then the plan being the map. So basically you iterate your way forward, you have an expectation, then you see what actually happens. Possibly you learn something. What you're doing in effect is poking reality. Since we can't really see reality, we try something and we poke reality. And because reality reacts, it reveals itself a little bit to us. And what we learn from it revealing to ourselves, we can use to inform our next step. So you're basically reassessing at each landing zone. 
The second research question, how can other companies develop similar routines and thinking in their organizations? How do you develop that useful thinking? It's not our default thinking, scientific thinking. This runs into something some people call the information action fallacy. And it's an idea that if we share information, it will lead to change thinking. If we share enough information, if we make a convincing argument, if we have a good research model, we write a good book, that will change how people think and act. Uh, and it's just not how the brain works. Models alone don't change behavior. It takes deliberate practice. Scientific thinking ain't difficult, but you do have to practice it. And these are some ingredients of deliberate practice. This kind of represents what you'll see a Toyota manager working with. Um, you know, he's coaching, he or she's coaching their people. The practice is frequent, a little bit every day. Uh, it's better to practice a little every day than a lot once a week or once a month. Uh, and so forth and so on. So various ingredients of deliberate practice. So what we did, and this was the third phase of the research, we took our model and then we developed starter practice routines for each step of the model. We call them starter kata. These starter kata are not from Toyota. They're a mechanism to try to make the findings that we have transferable. This is one of the best illustrations I've found for the role of starter kata, these simple very focused, structured practice routines you practice at the beginning. See on the left-hand side in the swimming pool, the coach is having everybody do the same thing. You know, and you can just about hear the swimmers going, I, I don't wanna practice my kick, I wanna swim. You'll be able to swim in the future, but first you gotta get these fundamental routines, these fundamental skills down. And then you can see as the learner progresses eventually in the right end of the pool, uh, everyone develops their own style. The coach is merely watching. Uh, but you had to kind of get through that initial practice. That's what the starter kata are for. Uh, and I just want to say that the workplace is an excellent place to practice. So a lot of you have a workplace or will be going to a workplace. You've got real goals and problems there to work on. There are people who can coach one another and it's daily. You'll be there every day, at least I think so, sometime in the future again. You're there every day. So it's an excellent place to practice. And here's what happens. This is a recent tweet. Uh, someone from a workplace tweeted, today a team member brought in a container from home to try out in a process. I asked if he was thinking in the improvement kata steps outside of work in this scientific thinking pattern. His answer, I am thinking like this everywhere. And this is what happens. We can practice in the workplace uh, because it's, an, it's, it's a great place to practice. And then it spreads to uh, the, your team members everyday life. So I'd like to end here. You can make your workplace, your team, a, a, a place, a force for positive change. So I invite you to turn your team or your workplace into a forum for practicing practical everyday scientific thinking, which then spills over into society as people take home the scientific skill, skill and mindset that they acquired at work and apply it to the various issues in their personal life and ultimately to uh, raising and teaching their own children. So uh, this is kind of the art from studying Toyota's production system and how come they keep improving it and how do they keep this uh, entrepreneurial mindset going even in a mature company to, wow, this is a lever with which we can achieve almost anything we want beyond the workplace as well.